A man possessed of a strange urge treads the length and breadth of the country, going from village to village, virtually leaving footprints upon the sands of time, making an indelible impress upon the minds of the people he meets. Acharya Vinoba Bhavi. For nearly 11 years, he has spanned great distances between places and people. His mission, the spread of a gospel which rests on three words, truth, love, compassion. Three words which precipitate just one action. Give. Land to the landless. Food to the poor. Solace to the disconsolate. Succor to the helpless. People call him saint. They have given him the title of Acharya, the great scholar. On the 11th September 1962, Acharya Vinoba Bhavi completed 67 years of his life. But these long years of austere, self-disciplined living haven't bent his posture. Nor has deep, intense thought cut furrows in his brow. His face is ageless. Only his grey beard betrays his age. Years of neglect and strain have dimmed his sight. But his eyes have lost none of their sparkle of youth. His thick, grisly hair, always in a tangle, also gives him a look of youthful abandon. He dresses in meticulous white khadi, spun and woven by his own hands. In everything he does, he is thorough and systematic. He never lets any detail escape him whether he is planning his tour or studying ancient literature. In the matter of his diet, too, he is scientific and systematic. He has tried different regimens of diet on himself to find the one which suits him best. For years now, he has been living solely on curd and honey, just enough to sustain the body. Whenever he has time, he loves to help in the kitchen, especially when there are guests. But whatever be the company at his table, he sticks to his curd and honey. No wonder he weighs so little. But within his slight frame, he conceals a vast store of mental and physical energy that would be the envy of many a young man. Not that he has never succumbed to illness. He is a patient of chronic malaria, dysentery and a stomach ulcer. But he never lets these ailments hamper his work. The Ganges never stops. Why should I? He has never stopped. The landlords of India must be persuaded to share their lands with the landless poor. That is the only way to ensure lasting happiness 
in India's countless villages. He calls it revolution through love. Ever since he started his Bhudan Yagna in April 1951, he has been constantly on the move, devoting every single day to the fulfillment of his mission. It is 1.30 a.m., many hours before dawn. Vinoba is already up and immersed in study. At 3 a.m., he is ready to leave for the next village. At his destination, a rousing welcome awaits him, for word of his coming has reached here before him. Here, in this village, already astir with affectionate delight, Vinoba will make his home for one day. It will be a day of ceaseless activity, with every minute spent usefully. Vinoba starts the day like always with morning classes. The pupils are all members of his team. The subjects, scriptures and philosophy. It is time for breakfast. Vinoba eats a frugal meal of liquid curds sweetened with gur. Outside his hut, the people wait to see him. He likens these people to the rays of the morning sun. He opens his doors to them and they flood his abode with warmth and light. Among these people, there is no breathless awe of him. There's only delight and affection. <laughs> Once again, Vinoba returns to solitude and his books. He is a great pundit in his native Marathi literature. But he has also taught himself 15 other languages, so as to be able to communicate with his fellow human beings. As the morning ends, it is time for prayer. It may be a recitation from Tulsi Das's Ramayana, or chanting the Ramdhun. The prayer is over. Vinoba prepares to relax for a while. He does not sleep. He only stretches himself to conserve his energy. He shall soon have need of it. 
In the meantime, he has to attend to his correspondence and go over the day's appointments with his secretary. In the evening, the whole village gathers to hear the saint. This is the time they have been waiting for. They are eager to see him, to hear his voice. A divine thread binds them together, the people and their saint, Vinoba. God lives among the poor and is revealed in them. When Vinoba looks at them, he looks at God. He speaks to them in soft, caressing tones. To the landless poor, he brings new hope. The land, like water and air, belongs to all. The rich must share their lands with the poor. I ask for Bhutan, not as charity, but as my right. Few people can resist his loving command. Sometimes, he collects thousands of acres of land in one day. He is grateful to God for this gift for the poor. The evening deepens. Vinoba is soon resting in slumber. Tomorrow he must walk to the next village where another day of activity awaits him. His work lies in remote villages. But he keeps himself well informed about world affairs. He carries his own office with him wherever he goes. Very often, he dictates articles and accounts of his experiences for publication in newspapers and magazines. He uses every available medium to spread his message of love. There is hardly a day when he does not have a distinguished visitor, for all national leaders are interested in his work. Such is the compelling personality of this devoted scholar, this frail being who has taken it upon himself to lead his country towards a great social revolution, the revolution which was the dream of Mahatma Gandhi. Still, he is no politician. Whenever he is not with the people, he likes to retire to solitude. For it is in solitude that he can think best. In the silence that surrounds him, he can hear the voice of reason more clearly. Solitude also gives him the opportunity to know more about the different religions and beliefs. Here, in these books of faith, he finds the same absolute truth the word of God. Vinoba's quest for truth started early in life. On the 11th of September 1895, he was born in the village of Gagode in Kolaba district near Bombay. This is where he spent his early years, surrounded by rich pastoral loveliness. In the village, there was a temple of Lord Shiva, where young Vinayak used to go with his mother. Here, he watched his mother bathe the idol slowly, pouring water over it, drop by drop. To little Vinayak, it seemed such a waste of time. Why not empty the vessel over the idol and be done with it? His mother stopped him. 
These are not mere drops of water, my son. These are moments of time. Each drop that falls is a moment spent in worship. The longer it lasts, the better it is. There was a copy of the sacred Gita in the house. Young Vinayak used to read it every day. One day, while he was reading it, a beggar called at the door. He appeared strong and capable of earning his own living. Yet, his mother took some grain from the bin to give him. When Vinayak protested, she said, My son, it is not for us to judge others. We should share our good fortune with others and not ask questions. His mother was thus his first teacher. She showed him how faith could triumph where reason failed. Here in this village home, he read the lives and works of great saints. He read them eagerly and a little restlessly. He marveled at the great lonely heights to which they had risen by sheer faith. A strange yearning took root in his young mind, a yearning that was later to flower into an ardent quest. But soon, Vinayak was to leave the village. He went to Baroda. This was a large city and presented a sharp contrast to the tranquil peace of his village home. Here lived and worked his father, Narhari Pant. Vinayak joined the Baroda Central High School to start his formal education. Even at this age, he was given to austere living and hard work. He passed his matriculation in 1913 with French as his second language. He joined the Baroda College for Higher Studies, but soon realized that the answers to his questions did not lie in these corridors nor in these classrooms. His mind strained forward to know the truth and that was not to be found in his college textbooks. He spent many hours in the college temple in meditation. The libraries and reading rooms of the city became his constant haunts. He ransacked the shelves of the Baroda Central Library in his search for knowledge. He wanted discernment, not cleverness. He wanted to get close to the nature of reality. He was strangely moved by beauty. He would sometimes pour out his heart on paper in lines of verse. But attachment of any kind made him uneasy and he quickly consigned his work to the river. The ascetic in him continued to search for something of permanent value and led him to philosophy. But his young heart repeatedly turned to poetry. He would compose verse 
then grow restless and destroy his work. This was not what he wanted. He wanted to know the meaning of creation, of truth, of life. Soon, all education that aimed at mere training for adult worldly life became meaningless to him. About that time, too, appeared a notice on his college notice board. Vinayak was to go to Bombay to take his intermediate examination. His mother, with tears in her eyes, had wished him success. But success in what? A whole panorama of the future passed before his eyes. There would be examination after examination. He would attach a few degrees to his name, then get a lucrative job and settle down to a purposeless life. But he had already made his choice. Instead of Bombay, he turned to Benares, the holy city of learning, the ancient halfway house on the road to knowledge. Of the many paths open to him, he had chosen the most difficult one. He ate from a free kitchen, which gave him one meal a day. For the rest, he would manage with whatever he could get. He spent all his time in study and meditation. That year, the foundation stone of the Banaras Hindu University was laid. The Central Hindu High School was the venue for an address by Mahatma Gandhi in the presence of the Viceroy and many Indian princes. He said, and I feel like saying, to these noblemen that there's no salvation for India unless you strip yourself of this jewelry and hold it in trust for your countrymen in India. Like everybody else, Vinayak too was deeply impressed by Gandhiji's fearlessness and faith in non-violence. He learned that Gandhi had started an ashram at Ahmedabad for training an army of satyagrahis. The weapon of this new army would be non-violence and capacity for unlimited suffering. Very soon, he found himself at the master's feet. In Gandhiji, he found a kindred soul. He too was searching after truth through love and non-violence. Life in the ashram was underlined by simplicity and strict adherence to the exacting tenets of Satyagraha. The strength of a true Satyagrahi came from humility and self-invited suffering. Most of all, he must cultivate a sense of unity with the dispossessed, poverty-stricken masses of India. To Vinayak, coming to Gandhiji was like coming home. He decided to continue his pursuit of truth near his inspiring presence. It was during his stay at the ashram that Vinayak had his first glimpse of death. It happened one day when the Sabarmati was in spate and Vinayak was washing his clothes at the river bank.
Vinayak was saved, but not before he had gazed into the dark eternities that lie beyond this life. There is something about the experience of being near death which opens the doors to further knowledge. It prepares the mind to venture forth into new areas of thought. His quest of knowledge took him to Wai, the sacred home of Sanskrit learning. He turned to the Upanishads and to ancient Hindu sages and seers. Om Purna Meda Purna Medam Purna Purna Mudhuchate Eko Deva Sarvabhute Shuguha Sarvavyapi Sarvabhuta Antaratma Yadvacha Nabhidetan Yedavaka Bhuddhate Yan Manasana Manute Yenahur Manomatam Tato Virada Jayata Virajo Adhipurusha Vedaha metam purusham mahantam aditya varanantam asastupare Though much had been written, it seemed that every man must find his own answers. What is Brahma? What is the ultimate reality of creation? Vinayak found that in human suffering and compassion lay both the question and the answer. God resided not in the Himalayas or in the heavens, but in the lowly and the poor, since they had great capacity for suffering and for love. One day, when Vinayak was working in the ashram, he saw the scavenger's son come to clean the latrines. But the boy was not used to the job. It filled him with disgust. Seeing this, Vinayak decided to help him. The inmates of the ashram, not yet initiated into the spirit of Gandhi's philosophy, were shocked at what they saw. His co-workers, still caught in the mesh of caste prejudices, could not forgive Vinayak's pollution by an untouchable. Vinayak decided to strike at the very roots of such prejudices. He declared that he was a Brahmin, not because he wore a sacred thread, and that in the eyes of God, all men were equal. Mahatma Gandhi was deeply moved. In a letter to Vinayak's father, he wrote, Your son Vinoba is with me. Young as he is, he has reached spiritual heights which have taken me years of patient labor to attain. From this day onward, Vinayak became Vinoba. Back at home, great suffering lay in wait for Vinoba. Death hovered over his home in Baroda. The influenza epidemic of 1918 claimed the life of his mother. That loving and tender being, his first teacher and spiritual guide, was no more. In his immense grief, Vinoba turned to the Gita for solace and comfort. He brought away with him one of his mother's saris as her last memory. For many days, he used the sari as a rest for his troubled head. Then, one day, he discovered that the sari had not been made from hand-spun material. He had promised Mahatma Gandhi that he would never wear anything except what was hand-spun and hand-woven. So, he consigned the sari to the river. In 
In 1918, Mahatma Gandhi sent Vinoba to Vartha to start an ashram there. The greatest need of the day was social reconstruction, to discover the living elements in the roots of old tradition and build upon them a society where all people would be equal. Vinoba started many institutions for training social workers. He himself retired to Paunar, a village nine miles from Vartha. Here, he established his own ashram for a novel experiment. An experiment in self-sufficiency, freedom from the use of money, and austere, selfless living. For a long time, nobody in India, except his close associates, knew anything about him and his work. Years passed. In September 1939, the Second World War started in Europe. The British government of India imposed restrictions on free speech and political assembly. As a protest, Mahatma Gandhi launched the movement of individual satyagraha. He chose Vinoba as the first satyagrahi. That was when Vinoba's name was first heard by the Indian public. Vinoba caught a arrest and was jailed. Thereafter, he went to jail several times. The jails were full. There were political prisoners like himself, and there were ordinary criminals. But his heart did not condemn them. He thought of them with kindness and love. They too had been little children once, innocent and playful. And now they were considered criminals, dangerous to society. There's goodness in every man, though it may not show on the surface. Consider a cabbage, for example. It may be rotten on the outside, but remove its damaged layers, and the core, like the human heart, is pure and fresh. Nothing can spoil it. After every jail term, Vinoba returned to his ashram and his work, away from the political upheavals in the country. Then came independence and brought with it the partition of the country, insane violence, and great misery. Gandhiji was deeply disturbed. With his own heart torn and bruised, the Mahatma set out to wipe the tears of the people. Vinoba too was restless with grief. The firm rock of non-violence upon which he had stood, seemed to be crumbling. But the demon of violence had still to do its worst. Suddenly, the light that had guided was no more. was prostrate with grief and frustration. Had the people of India rejected the creed of non-violence? There was peasant unrest in Telangana. There was widespread violence, arson and looting. Terror reigned over the area. In March 1951, Vinoba was persuaded to attend a Sarvodaya conference at Shivrampalli in Telangana. He decided to walk the distance from his ashram to the venue of the conference. He wanted to find out for himself 
the troubles of the people. He decided to go to the heart of the troubled areas. The village of Pochampalli. It was a village of contrasts, combining poverty with plenty. The tranquility of the place was misleading, for its walls still bore the scars of violence. Vinoba's first task was to settle down to a study of the problems of this village. Here, there were those who had too much, and those who had nothing. The haves did not like to share with the have-nots. So, the hungry snatched away by force what they thought was their rightful share, violence. The poor of the village were shockingly poor. They lived in ugly slums oppressed by want and misery. Many of them found it difficult to manage even one meal a day. Here were men without opportunity to make good, children without a future. The village had rich rice lands, but only a few possessed them, and these few lived comfortable, sated lives. No wonder such abundance invited pillage and plunder at the hands of the dissatisfied masses. Couldn't he do something to improve matters? He visited the Harijan Bastis. He saw for himself their appalling poverty. That evening, a meeting of the villagers was addressed by Vinoba. The Harijans were poor, they had no land to till. Yet, there was enough land in Pochampalli to meet the needs of everyone. There were some in this village who had much more than their needs. There were 40 Harijan families who owned nothing but want. What was the village going to do about it? Would the rich be willing to share their plenty with the poor? And there was a rich landlord, Ramchandra Reddy, in this assembly, who stood up and said, I am willing to give. This indeed was a miracle. Vinoba himself could not believe that it had happened. Suddenly, the large stores of love that lie locked in every human heart were released in an overwhelming torrent. In discovering Bhudan, Vinoba discovered himself. Here was a method to achieve the ideals of Sarvodaya, the method of love. Since he had at last found the mission of his life, he vowed never to stop his pilgrimage. Relentlessly, he walked the length and breadth of the province. If you have five sons, consider me your sixth. Give me one-sixth of your land. People found it difficult to refuse him. Before Vinoba left Telangana, 50 days later, he had collected 12,000 acres of land for distribution to the landless poor. 
he walked from state to state. In three years, he had walked nearly 10,000 miles and collected four million acres of land as Bhutan. Donation of land, he says, is not enough. Every material possession of an individual should be part of the collective wealth of the village, available to one and all. Even children can make a free gift of their labor or set apart a portion of their food for the poor. And what if you have nothing in the world to give? One day, an old man came to see Vinoba. He had nothing to give, neither land, nor money, nor labor. But you have a lot to give, said Vinoba. There's love in your heart, and there's compassion in your tears. There's no gift to equal the tears of compassion. Vinoba's great faith in human nature was vindicated recently by dacoits of the Chumbal Valley. For years, contingents of armed police had tried to rid the valley of the dacoits. Vinoba decided to carry his message of love to these human inhabitants of the jungle. He met them without police escort, and they listened patiently to what he had to say. Many of them carried death sentences on their heads, but the effect of his words was amazing. According to Vinoba, there is no dispute that cannot be resolved by truth and understanding. One day, two farmers came to him for arbitration. They had been quarreling for a long time, each saying that the other had wronged him. They were all but ready for a long legal battle. But Vinoba's methods are different. As both of them accused each other of lying, Vinoba made a suggestion. Both of you seem to know where the other has erred. But supposing you tell me about the wrong that you yourself have done. It became obvious that each of them had been to some extent guilty. Really speaking, there would have been no dispute at all if they had stopped to scrutinize their own actions. Vinoba thus has a way of creating trust and confidence in place of hatred and malice. There are many who don't agree with him. What, for instance, is wrong with money? Money is necessary, he says, but money is to life what water is to a canoe. What good is a canoe without water to support it? But what will happen if the water gets into the canoe and overwhelms it? That is how greed drowns the good in every man. Vinoba is very happy when he is with children. Often he tells them an interesting parable or two. Tell me, children, what is the difference between a man and a monkey? A monkey begs for his food or steals it. A man, however, earns his livelihood by the sweat of his brow.
Would you wish to be like monkeys? Heroic in his faith, the saint walks, spanning large distances, bridging gulfs between hearts, alleviating misery that is centuries old, trying to restore India's faith in herself. As he does this, he identifies himself with the people, especially the poor among them. One evening, he looked at them lovingly and said, Today, I realized that I had not looked at myself in the mirror for a long time, and I wondered why. The answer came to me here when I saw you all. I do not look into the mirror because I have only to look at you to discover myself. Your faces are mine. Your voices are mine too. What use have I then for the dead surface of glass? As he says this, he unknowingly holds the mirror up to the people. In it, they see themselves, the landlords and the landless peasants. They see themselves and their misery and how unnecessary it is. He illumines the minds of the people with a strange light and their minds are rid of greed. They are ready to share with others whatever they possess. Some of the things he says do not reach our ears, deafened as we are by the complex labyrinth of noise around us. Time and again, he asks us to stop and ponder. Efficiency and speed are of no use unless they are combined with serenity of mind. Machines should lead to satisfaction and not to multiplication of wants and possessions. To him, service of man consists in a satisfying and meaningful contact with his fellows. While we move along with mad speed and preoccupation, unmindful of our neighbor, he asks us to create a happy, self-sufficient individual in a happy, contented society. This, he says, is the only way to achieve lasting happiness. It is not merely a utopian vision. It is very much of this world, for truth, love and compassion are human qualities and have been the quest of the human spirit ever since the world began.